Well, hi, everybody. Welcome back to Speed Tips by Bob and Chad. Episode number 111. With us tonight, we've got Paul Berger, the main chassis guy behind B&B Chassis, Mr. Stock Car himself, and then we lost, there he is. Um, so anyway, how are you guys doing tonight? Good. 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 There's got to be more to the story than that. <laughs> No, I'm doing good. I did actually, like I said earlier, I got I got I got three teeth pulled today, so I'm actually happy. I'm talking and uh, I'm not in no pain, so they get you scared. But we'll, we'll wait, wake up tomorrow and see what that feels like. But so far, so good on that. There you go. Well, that's a good deal. So, what's new and exciting at Weir's Machine? Oh, not too much. We, uh, <clears throat> you know, slowing down this time of year. We had a little. Uh, we had the asphalt races in town last weekend, so. We were out there watching that and hanging out for that deal. And uh, now we're getting to catalog season hardcore. So we're working on the catalog and trying to get that finalized and get all the new products finished up and get ready for the, the build season. Um, we are planning, I think, another factory support event. I think the boys decided today they want to go to Ogilvy. And I think that's oh. ne next weekend for that deal. So uh barring any catastrophes we should hopefully have a couple guys at ogilvy for that i think it's the topless nationals so oh excited to get back up there again it's been a while since factory sports been there so that should be good good you guys gonna have any metric rear control arm bolts in the new catalog <laughs> well we got the standard one the 326 that we've had forever and the new frame uh and paul can elaborate on it but the the new stock car frame, they put a little window in there. So the bolt we were making, the for years, the problem was the hex head. You had to put a socket inside the frame rail. So we moved the hex outside of the, the frame rail to eliminate that problem. Well, the new frame has a window. So Berger drew up some new design bolts for the new chassis that's coming out. So that'll be a little bit shorter. You know, they got a little window underneath there now so you can get a wrench in there. So it should be a way better deal. I'm glad they fixed that. Awesome. Yeah, yep. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, well, there's a lot of racing still going on. Um, we watched the races at uh, Tipton last weekend. Uh, Makaya Heideball, 72H, sort of won, uh, this, I think, Friday night. Uh, just typical two laps to go restart thing, bidding. And uh, so he's had a good year with his B&B car. Uh, yeah, overall, that he has. Yeah, overall, you guys have had a really good year at BNB. Yeah, it's been it. It has been it. Uh, I'm always sometimes I never. It always feels like you just stay busy doing with what you're doing. You never get a look look above the clouds to actually see how good some of the guys really have been doing this year. But um, yeah, all in all, I mean, it was definitely a good year. I don't I don't think we ended off with total wins where we did the year before, but. I think a lot, a lot of that played into just with the uh, amount of rainouts we had at the beginning of the season. Yeah. stuff. it was pretty. Yeah, there's a lot of well, weekends. Even that mid season, there was a lot of rainouts. What's that? I said even mid season there was a lot of rainouts. Yeah, there was. It yeah, it was pretty crazy. It had been now, one of the rain years I can remember. Yeah, now I can really use some rain. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah you go from don't want it, and then now we got too much, or we don't have enough of it. Well, I've been pretty yep. pleased. We've actually stayed pretty busy. The shop guys have stayed pretty busy. We've had quite a bit of stuff going on in the back shop. Uh, you know, the, the shock stuff, of course, is, is typical seasons kind of starting to run down. So that's kind of quieted up a little bit. Um, but we, we still shipped out quite a bit of stuff today, which I was pretty surprised about that. So, but it's that time of the year. I um, think we sold a stock car today. Uh, Solar Sport Mod, uh, I think it was last Friday. So that's pretty exciting. I mean, we, we were pretty sure. And we've got a, a modified that a guy is uh, considering pretty pretty healthy from out in Oregon. So, so yeah, it's been pretty good. I, I'm, you know, I kind of wondered what the election cycle might do, but it doesn't seem to have 
really affected our industry a whole lot. Uh, I mean, I think it maybe delayed some purchases a little bit, but I, I don't think it really does. Yeah, I know on our end, we're pretty, um, we're sitting pretty good. It's not uh, not complaining. We got enough cars to build for right now. And I know after putting up the new shop last year, we really never got a chance to sit down and kind of retool and organize everything. And that's kind of what we'll be doing the last couple of weeks here. So hopefully after this week, we can get into, get back to, you know, building three cars, two and a half, three cars a week. So then you know, we should be sitting all right. But Supposedly I heard you're building Jake McBurney another new car. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we've been working on that. I know uh, Kennedy stopped out here the other day and going through some things on there and different things he wants to do and try some different stuff. And yeah. So what's going on with the new frame? Is that thing, is somebody racing it or where is it at? We had one, we had one, we raced it one time. Uh, Elijah Zevenberg drove it uh, one night. And I mean, it was pretty good results. I mean, he started 25th and motor had a miss in it and it was kind of, uh, you know, and if it, I, I, I hate to say it, I mean, I think the car was running right. And he kind of laid down the first four laps because he didn't want to wreck anything. And he ended up, he was passing Matt Lothar, my other car. He was passing him for fifth place on the checkered flag. So, I mean, yeah, I think if if, if the motor had been running right, I think he had won the thing from 25th. I mean, it was pretty impressive. He he did a really good job driving it. Um, and then uh, Dan Jury bought it. Um, and then he raced it down at US Air Nationals or whatever. You know, he didn't have very good luck with it or whatever. But, I mean, it, you know you know, wrong adjustment, whatever. And, they, you know, he kind of said they got some stuff put in the car in the wrong spot or whatever, and it just didn't work out for him down there. But, I mean, from what I've seen, at least we know it's a race car and it can race. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm definitely not afraid of it at all. It's probably better that it doesn't go out and just win everything it starts because you don't really want that either, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you, we yeah. don't want it to, we don't, we, we don't want it, we don't want it so good that everybody else's stuff isn't good. So, um, you know, at least we don't races and it's, it's, it's definitely nice to work with. It's nice to build with, and it's it's just ne a nice option to have. There's no doubt about that. Um, we've got uh, one question. Uh, Russ wants to know how does adding or reducing tow affect the race car? What's you guys' opinion? Well, I can I I I can say this firsthand because I actually been racing a modified for the last two years. I mean, I know it doesn't do good in the stock car world, but um, I do know that the the common denominator of racing is the same. And if you, you know, if you're running a ton of toe out in a car, I mean, it just, if your toe's not right, like I'm real anal about where my toe's at on a car. Like it, I, I like to keep our stuff around an eighth inch to a quarter inch. It, if you, uh, especially if you're running a two barrel and you've got, you know, five eighths, three quarters, I know some guys do that in the slick. I mean, you're, you're spogging the car down. Cars are way easier to steer when the toe is closer to eighth and a quarter inch. So it's just, it's way easier to steer a race car when you got the tow where it's supposed to be. Towed in, obviously, your junk and just pull it in the pits and race another night. Um, Jason wants to know, Chad, what's the biggest change you see to work around going to zero indexing on an IMCA modified? Well, I would say that generally it makes the car freer uh, into the corner. So... That's why a lot of people, you know, you, you do it to get compliance and grip, but it makes so much more entry traction that it makes the car freer on entry. And it allows you to get more hike and more bar angle, which then will induce more roll steer. We'll get the car on the right front harder. So I think one of the most common first changes is people usually have to add a little right front spring to the car when they go to zero index uh, just to make that you know, control the right front motion because it's going to get so much more motion on the right front. Uh, but generally, uh, most people say it frees them up on entry. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, that's kind of been the experience that we've had. Um, Robert wants to know, if you could use a spring rubber, when and how would you use them? Would you use them on the right side at feature time or add to wheel load? Well, you definitely would want to make sure that you uh, use them on, on the right side where the springs are pretty well compressed so that the rubber doesn't actually come out of the spring. The biggest thing that I, I learned when we could, when we were, it was legal to run a spring rubber is don't put it in the middle of the spring like you see a lot of people do. What that does then is that makes that spring a progressive spring. So all of a sudden your rate per inch changes 
uh, always put it clear to the one end so that it's kind of almost like a dead coil and it helps stiffen the car up. What I would have to, I mean, I, I actually like it. I mean, we used to run a 175 pound right rear and then put a spring rubber for like a heat racer or whatever, put a spring rubber in, in and it would actually rate out it to be about a 190. So I thought it was a pretty good deal, but safety reasons is why, you know, a lot of the sanctioning bodies have made them illegal because they would come out of the spring and, and uh, cause problems. Um, Jordan wants to know, does adding the mid plate in a stock car help with overall flex? Can I answer that question? Yeah, go ahead. I was waiting for you, Paul. I, I was literally, I've literally, I said this like 10 times. I go, I saw, and I even said, I talked to Bobby this morning. I'm like going, we need to talk about chassis flex. We need, like, that needs to be talked about because, like, I get so sick and tired of hearing people like, oh, your car's too rigid or, oh, your car's too rigid. That's why it doesn't work. I, a mid plate, obviously, yes, you put a mid plate in a car, that's going to probably make the car more rigid. You're going to clearly, you're bolting it together. But, as far as like a car being too rigid or a car being, you know, too much flex, I myself don't think you can sometimes build these cars too rigid because, you know, like I was saying to a guy the other day, like, you know, Chad Weirs doesn't make a tool that can, you can't measure chassis flex. You can't measure anything in a chassis with, you know, when it's flexing. So I would rather see a chassis that's more rigid so then you can pay more attention to your corner weights and your corner loads and it's going to be more effective. Granted, your setup might have to be a little more spot on, but the way racing goes these days, I mean, if you're not measuring your suspension with a dial indicator or a suspend or a tape measure, I mean, then the guy that did just passed you. So, I mean, it you just we all need to pay more attention to our setups and not to go off on a tangent. But um, yeah, I I mean, put a mid plate in a car. Who cares? You know, make your car more rigid. I I we've got chassis out there. We got slider bars in them, um, and you know. We, you know, I, I don't want to name drop, but we, you know, we, Shelby Williams has a car that's got a bunch of slider bars in it. And that car is probably one of the fastest cars qualifying, but 10 laps, 15 laps into a race, he's fading backwards. Well, is it, was it because of his setup or is it because of cars flexing out too, or flexing too much? And then we go, you go to another track, put new tires on it, and then you have the same result, you know? So, I mean, it's like, <clears throat> and we don't have that problem with cars that are real rigid. So, in my opinion, I, I'm I'm more I'm leaning more towards I want to pay attention to my corner weights and make sure my corners are doing the job and not trying to play where my car's flexing. So we do make a tool actually. <clears throat> it's called a load stick. Yeah, really? Oh yeah. Well yeah. Yeah. Yep. We have all kinds of chassis builders that you know uh, at the professional level it's come down to when a race team has multiple chassis. And you take three cars, and they're trying to run the same baseline in three cars. If yeah, some if if some tube is welded a little bit different, and that thing flexes a little bit different, it's yep. can make the load number off by thirty to eighty pounds. It it's crazy how good them guys are, and how from car to car to car they can tell when there's just a little bit of difference. So they're actually taking the load sticks, and they're taking the frame, and they're making the frame rigid, and they're flexing the right front up to test how much them cars flex, and then they'll actually match them. So if driver A gets three cars, they try to get three cars that are very close flex-wise for that driver. Um, right. But as far as, right. Tuning, right. as far as tuning with flex, I mean, obviously that can be done too, but definitely have tools to check flex and there are chassis builders doing that just so they can repeat you know even if you build every car identical i mean all it takes is welding one direction or different way on a two wrong way to change yep. how the chassis cools down or well, whatever exactly and like i mean uh, correct me if i'm wrong but i mean i think every nascar team has one to two engineers and that's all they do is literally does you know take flex out of the chassis they're doing everything they can possibly do to pull flex out of the chassis, you know, because that, that, in my opinion, that's just where the inconsistencies come in is where, you know, I, I get, we don't want to be driving around an I beam. I mean, there's still, you know, things have to absorb, things have to work and things have to do, you know, whatever we're, we're, you're trying to do. But I mean, at the end of the day, you just, you don't want to race a car and don't have a front hoop in it or a tail in it just because you're trying to equate flex into your setup. Like, yeah, that's kind of crazy, but yeah. 
And I think it makes a big difference too on the weight of the car, you know, depending like on like a modified versus a stock car. Um, I think that's different. I, I think they probably need to flex differently or in, in driver wise, some guys, some guys, you know, like, you know, you take Kelly Shirock as an example, um, you know, his car, I'm quite sure is probably more rigid than most, but he, the, his driving style where you're, more go-kart driving than the guys that um, are, are up on the right rear and, 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 and nursing their, you know, muscle in the car. I, I think that has an effect. But as a builder, I mean, you, you got to do what you got to do to cover most of the people. And I mean, and, right. You know, if your opinion is that the car needs to be more rigid, that's what I would go with and, and then adjust accordingly. Yeah. You know, we've all of our cars on our modified side have a traction bar in it, which is basically just a bar that goes down from the main hoop or the, the crossbar where the brakes are mounted, goes down to the uh, right front. And, uh, you know, we've done a lot of experimenting with that, going without it, taking it out and taking it, putting it back in. And, uh, you know, like as an example, we put a car on the jig and went to unbolt that bar and that thing moved a half an inch yep, yep. so i mean it's it's amazing i mean it, yeah it, and, it and there's is. no doubt because i mean it's the same thing it's the same thing uh we don't i don't you know like left rear drop and load all that stuff on i mean it's, it's unbelievable how much the left rear of the car drives you know left rear corner of the car drives the car even just by how much you know how much more drop you put in the left rear of a car or how much it affects your right front and then just all the equal and opposite of reaction of everything that happens to the car. I mean, I don't know it. Yeah. So when, when a guy's paying that much attention to what your suspension's doing, sometimes I think it's just better to rule out the equivalent of chassis flex. I mean, that's just, that's kind of my, I mean, even like, even like I was saying to the guys in the shop today, if we took two springs, took two pieces of two, or a piece of tubing and just bolted a flat plate, you push down the center of that tubing, it's going to have equal load on both springs. Well, if we put a, take it and we cut it, put a cut halfway through that tube. Now we push down in the middle of that tube. Now we don't have no load or no positive input going into them springs anymore. So now we, now how, you know what I mean? So, and that in kind of it's in the same theory, if you got a bar bone in the middle of the car like that, I mean, now you don't have no positive input on that corner or suspension of your car. And you're just, you're, you're out to launch. In my opinion, well, I could be way wrong. I, I believe a stiffer car is definitely a better feature car. I mean, it, uh, you know, like you said, uh, talking about Shelby's car, I mean, I, I've seen that over time that it'd be the case. Uh, sometimes it's, yeah. they don't qualify. That car always good. fades. That car always fades all year long. That's all it's done is faded. It, mm. it just, you know, and you, and you know, the, the proof's in the pudding after a while, you know, it's just. Um, Sean, is there any weight difference between the Speedway frame and the stock metric frames? Yeah, the Speedway frame weighs 25 pounds more and it uh and it's in the rear of the frame. So it's 25 pounds difference from a factory frame, but it is 25 pounds in the tail of the frame. We actually when we built our very first car, we four cornered it. So we put, you know, we put the car on pads on all four corners. I never knew that powder coat in the chassis weighed 35 pounds. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, Just that's lost amazing. Black powder coat, 35 pounds. Wow. Yep. Hmm. That's quite a bit. Uh, yeah. We have a question for you, Paul. He wants to know how <laughs> does the Dutch rubber affect play into your stock car chassis? Dutch rubber. And do we know what Dutch rubber is? That's oh, probably yeah. the rubber that Luke was driving in off Kurt Lund's stock car on oh. saturday night down at slate and <laughs> yeah yeah kurt or uh, luke finished second to kurt lund down there at slate and but i'm thinking that's what dutch rubber is yeah i seen he had a picture on facebook of rubber all over the front of his car yep yep uh let's see here paul our rules require same height springs across the rear does using a drop cup affect the spring table the same as a shorter spring would, or is this only changing the pivot point? How does the effect? How does it affect the car? 
Go for it, Chad. Yeah, so <clears throat> on, a, on a screw jack type suspension like that, it's not only the height of the spring, but it's also the location of the screw jack tip in the cup. So on the right rear, if you have a shorter spring, you're going to be lower. But if you also move that tip down compared to this one, if you have a top bearing cup here and a drop bearing cup here, it's going to be lower on the right and induce roll. So all the measurements are at ride height from the ground to the tip of the screw jack where it is in the cup. Uh, our AJ's got a question. Sport mod going into next year, mid states or a crate motor? LOL. Um, you know, if, if it depends on what they do with the, if they do anything with the engine rules, but uh, right now, definitely the open motor has an advantage. Uh, you get on a long, you know, like say Super Nationals, if you can qualify for the Super Nationals, with a crate motor, um, feature time wise, I, I think the crate motor would do very well. Problem is, is getting qualified, you've got, you know, feature time, the crate motor does a pretty good job, but, but overall to get qualified, you, you got to have the horsepower. Um, Ron, on an A mod, we lengthen the left rear chain two holes. Now we have knocked out two rear transmission seals. How much difference in setup? And scaling would it make if I moved the rear end back a half an inch? Um, it's going to be minimal. I mean, I would probably recommend getting your drive shaft shortened or getting a shorter drive shaft is what I would probably say. We ran into that problem this year ourselves. Just safer to get a shorter drive shaft. Yeah, that, that would be my suggestion because, you know, uh, changing the wheelbase is going to affect the car. Um, you know, I don't know if a half an inch is going to be a night and day difference and it's going to corner a little different. I mean, it's going to be different. I, I would say the drive shaft would be the way to go. Uh, Les, when figuring center of gravity on the rear of a four link A mod with a J bar, not center of gravity height, 54% left side weight, where would the roll center fall at? A point in space along or along the j bar um do you guys got an opinion on that i'd have to think about that one a little bit no it looks like you need a calculator and some paper for that one yeah it's generally I mean, measure, you really have to measure everything up but yeah it's really about halfway between yeah that's what i was thinking too um travis at what weight is too much for a sport mod? Cars these days seem to seem so light and they just skate across the track and can't use the power or, or crate motor can put out. Um, Travis, I, I think you need to work on your setup. Um, uh, you know, the lighter weight car, in my opinion, is still definitely the way to go. Uh, loading it up with weight to compensate for the over horsepower you have. Yeah, you just need to work on your engine guy to get the car a little more drivable with camshaft and, and make it a little bit more um, friendly that way. And then I'd work on your setup because it, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the lightweight car still, in my opinion, is the direction that I would go. I don't, I don't, you know, whatever the weight rule is, I make sure that they make weight and that's it. I mean, they don't have to carry a lot of extra. Uh, that's on a, uh, a sport mod type car. Now, a lot of guys look at that a little differently. They, they run more rear percentage, so they run a little bit more weight. Um, you know, it kind of just depends on the driver and, and how, what your setup is. What's your opinion, Paul? Um, it's kind of, I was kind of thinking in my head, it's the same thing, even like with the, with the modified, you know, you don't like our, like the stock car, if, you know, we have some guys that are running 56% rear weight, well, too much rear weight creates other problems too. You're, you get, you're loose on entry, you get too much traction and then you're bogging your motor down. I mean, we run into that quite a bit. And even in the modified, 
where, you know, you figure, you know, how much drop you have and then your, you know, your end load on the spring. And if you run a hundred pound spring with three inches of end load on that, you know, I mean, you got a car, you go in the corner, you get on the gas, you got so much drive thing pushes right front across track. Then you snap loose and then, then you don't have forward drive, but then you put a 175 in with minimal end load and then you got, you can't even spin the tires. So, I mean, you just got to mess around with your setup, but I mean, it, you know, that's the problem with all this thing. Everything has a balance. Everything has a point, you know, you too much of something is not enough for something else. You know, it's just got to find a happy medium. I mean, it's easy to say that, but unfortunately that, you know, racing is you just got to do a lot of testing what works for you and, you know, keep a good notebook and pay attention to what you're doing. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, Jeffrey wants to know the old bolt on the pull bar brackets still used or outdated. Uh, we actually don't use them anymore. The problem with them, the <coughs> bolt was manufactured with that fine threaded bolt. It wouldn't be too long. You know, what happens is people put on a, uh, an impact on there and now they're, they're getting better impacts and, and they were stripping the, those nuts out and stuff. So we just back, basically went back to just spacers and just a standard old bolt. We don't change it as much as we used to. I still think we probably should. Uh, I think there's there's some advantages to moving that left to right uh, in certain conditions, but you know it, it's more difficult to do, and so a lot of people don't mess with it. Uh, Last center of gravity would be halfway between the springs plus the negative for weight percentage. But now you hook up the J bar and the roll center changes because where the J bar hooks to the rear end and chassis. Awesome. Um, thanks for that, Les, I appreciate that. Well, you know, we've got Mr. Stocker on here and we haven't had a lot of stock car questions. And, and, we all you stocker guys we need to be um talking about that uh bob the extension brackets on the rear end plates um, not what he's talking about the plates not the bolt oh the plates uh yeah they, there's been all kinds of different changes in those plates i mean um People tried all kinds of different heights and different. I mean, we we played with that quite a bit this summer, early summer, and and uh, but yeah, there are all kinds of different plates nowadays. Uh, you know, we've got three different ones that we you know that we made ourselves that are different. I'm not completely sure why we got three different ones, but um, there there's something to that. So yeah, it's definitely. There's been some changes made there. Now your plate, you make Chad still the same as it was because, of course, you had it pretty adjustable the way it was. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> we're we're center line two back and two forward. So I would say that uh, nowadays we're trending more towards the middle of the rear end just because we don't travel the pull bar as far as we used to. We used to travel two and a half, three inches on the pull bar. Now we're traveling an inch to an inch and a half. So you don't need to be as far forward on the brackets so that it doesn't fall over center when you're when you're wrapping up. So we tend to go farther back then because it's more traction when it's farther back on the rear end. So it's kind of a balancing act. That doesn't mean you can't tune if your brackets are forward. I don't think you're gonna be able, you know, I think you'll be able to tune those in. It's just a little bit different timing versus being farther back. Yeah, I would agree with that. So you got any races you're going to there, Chad, yet this year? Well, I'm, I don't think I can't go to Ogilvy next week. I got a, a vacation plan, but uh, I think the boys will be there. And I don't know if I'm going anywhere until the dome, but okay, that could change. I understand. Um, Jason wants to know, Paul, what do you do with all the wood the beaver brings? <laughs> Jason should know that he brought the wood to the beaver last weekend. I think, yeah, it was that last Friday where he won the feature over at in South Dakota. Yep. He knows what happens. <laughs> oh, Jason, the guy that won, uh, Nichols was leading in broken axle. and Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. 
I mean, and Jason had a really good car. I mean, he, he was right there with Nichols. I mean, right right on Nichols' bumper. And then yeah. he had that restart, yep. and Nichols pulled off the racetrack. And I'm like, huh, wonder what the heck that is. Yeah, and I think Jason got third or fourth on Saturday night, too. Third. Yeah, I think so. Nichols won that one. He didn't break this time. but Yeah. We well, must have an awful lot of traction to break that right rear axle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, whoa! I know. I mean, I know he runs excellent shocks that give him lots of traction, but oh yeah, yeah. Yep. I don't know if they break axles. Dig for days. Yeah, no doubt. Um, Jordan, I'm learning about stock cars. How often between Boone and Marshalltown do they typically adjust their trailing arms? Um, you know. Just from the experience that I've had with that scenario, uh, they kind of adjust them actually during the night sometimes. Um, as far as adjusting them differently for Marshalltown versus Boone, I, I don't think they actually do that. Uh, I, I think everybody kind of starts with the same setup and then depends on what the racetrack actually does. Uh, you know, what, what's your opinion? I mean, it, it's pretty much a standard setup most of the time, isn't it, Paul? Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it honestly, it comes down to, I think, driver preference. Because, like, yeah. uh, Matt Loaf drives my stock car. And beginning of this year, he goes, he just didn't like, because we we always, like, ran on our brackets. We run top hole, middle hole, bottom hole. And we usually always, you know, a neutral hole is, like, the second one down. And uh, we always would raise the top one for the feature. And then. Matt just like, just leave it in the top hole and then I'll adjust my driving style for the heat races. So, and then that way there's, cause there's like one night we forgot to raise it up and then the car was junk and mm. you know, for him, for him, the way he likes it. So, I mean, all that, all that equates into like what you run for right rear, right rear ride height um, in a combat, you know, so some guys might run a lower ride height in the right rear already. So you don't need to run that, you know, you can run a little more angle in the right rear or vice versa. So, I mean, it's something guys got to mess around with, but, we just we actually quit moving our bar angles, just left you know the right side up up to the top and then the middle hole on the left side on the lower. So yeah, like I said, I I don't actually see guys. I mean, I, at the beginning of the year I seen people moving them, but I I don't see a lot of people doing that either. No, uh, -uh. it's not the easiest job in the world anyway. No, it's not. No. Um. Troy wants to know, Paul, can you build my new car with the shop lights turned off? I heard that we're all that's where all the magic is. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure that's where you start the miss welds and stuff like that. Yeah. That goes back into the flex deal. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. There's no yeah, whatever doubt. the customer wants, that's what we'll do. If they want to build it at night or in the dark, yeah, we'll do it. Hmm. Awesome. So, on back yeah. while we're on the while we're on the flex deal is the, so the, the stock frame is a C channel, right? Yep. And, and the new, new frame, frame is a square. Is a rectangle. Yep. So that's and that's kind of where I was going with that. I didn't elaborate enough, but that's kind of where I was going with that whole flex thing because the new, the new frame, that's one thing everybody keeps saying, you know, with a box tube, they're like, Oh my God, you know, like, and, and if somebody would have seen how fast Elijah was that night with that car, I mean, I know there's a little bit of grip on the track and blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, if, you know, it wasn't a hammer down, it was, you know, there's a little bit of grip in the track. But, I mean, it wasn't, yeah, it was pretty impressive. Like, I mean, it just, I don't think it's going to hurt anything. I don't, I, if anything, I think it's going to make a better race car, in my opinion. But it's, you know, a guy might have to mess around a little bit to fine tune it. But, you know. Awesome. Yeah, and even the way the back end's built, you know, the bulkhead and stuff. I mean, it's it's definitely... They're, they're going to be a little more rigid, without a doubt. Well, that's very interesting. We'll see how that all plays out. Yeah. There, there might I think it's like fun. anything. It just will, you know, we'll figure it. You always figure out a way. You know, we have a couple guys that don't want to use. They want to use. Well, pretty much every car we've got ordered this year is on a new frame. We have a couple that aren't, but, you know, I, I – my opinion is obviously you're going to build a new car. I definitely do it on a new frame just because, you know, we're going to have to go there anyways, eventually. So you might as well figure it out now. Yeah. But I don't think it's going to be too big of a deal to figure out. It's. Well, I know when uh, on the modifieds, when they went from the stock frame to the like the AFCO or the aftermarket frame, um, 
you know, there was a little bit of difference, a little hesitation and all that. And now all of them are built on an aftermarket frame. Yeah, exactly. Of course, finding six conspiracy theorists and all that will be a little difficult. Yep. So you got any more races up there by you, Paul? Or was last this last? Uh, no, I think we're. I think we're all wrapped up. We had Arlington's was last Saturday was our last night there. And then uh, we might do, we might race the modified down in South Dakota that next weekend on the 17th, 18th. We're thinking about maybe going there, but I know Nichols said, he goes, that's a long ways to drive to DNF. And I'm like, seriously, <laughs> but I kind of have a tendency of doing that with a modified. I don't know why. But. Hmm. Well, what else are you going to do? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. Yep. It's always fun playing with the new equipment in the shop, though. We've been, that's always fun to do that, but sometimes you got to take a break from it, too. Yeah. Uh, Gary says, Hi, Jerry Van Sickle. I don't know. If Jerry <laughs> it's funny. Like, I literally at Super Nationals, I wish I would have been walking around with a microphone because, like, people would come up to me and they'd like, you know, come walk and look at you to the side, you know, like, cause you think you're know, like, Oh, thinking I'm Van Sickle or whatever. And you're just like, Oh, I mean, I know he looks a lot like me. I don't look anything like him, but <laughs> yeah, it's weird though. And all the time down there, it's like somebody's always, yep. It's pretty really? funny. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I never really seen him much, but I listened to him an awful lot. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's pretty funny when he gets after the drivers, when they're, being idiots on the racetrack or yeah, it's pretty funny. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> hilarious. Of course they can't hear it, but yep. At least he puts his two cents into it. Yep, exactly. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Yeah. Marshalltown, he's the flag man. And it's pretty exciting watching that because he'll get he'll jump off that flag stand and he'll just chew somebody's butt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember when when Bobby was um, probably I suppose Bobby was probably about eight, so it must have been about uh, twenty eight years ago. He was the flagman at the go kart racetrack. And yeah, he'd go out there and he's been around for a while. He doesn't. Oh yeah, uh, he'd go out there and try yeah. to chew on those little kids, and of course they'd look at him like, "Who in the hell are you?" Yep, yeah. that's right. Um, Cody, appreciate your video. They help a lot. I have an IMCA hobby stock, and it's tight in the turns. 1,100 pound and 1,000 pound in the front, and 225 and 175 left rear. What could I do to free it up on a quarter mile racetrack? Uh, he didn't tell us where which one where was the one. Yeah, and he didn't tell us which front spring i'm assuming he's got the, the 1100 in the left but uh yeah i i mean and where's the yeah and where's he tight at in the corner is it on entry or is it when he gets on the gas or yeah but and cody we need a, a couple more explanations there before we can really give you the best that we could uh david says so does a flexible frame or a rigid frame make a better race car well, David, if you just tuned in, you missed all that. Paul also also the host the Paul also host the price is right at one time. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I think Luke's doing fireball shots tonight. Is what he he doesn't drink as far as I know, but I think I think he's got into somebody's hooch. Is what's going on there? Yeah. Well, you know that can happen. <laughs> you know, I, I mean. Sometimes, like on a Monday, you got to stop after work, you know. Yep, yep. Because you made it through. The I would week. say that David Colts, in my in my opinion, I I will tell I will say that I believe a rigid race car makes a better race car, um, but you definitely have to man up on your setup abilities. Like you got, you know, I I definitely you just got to pay attention to your tape measure when you're when you're doing your adjustments and all that stuff. Yeah, the um, yeah that's that's one of the things with a more rigid car, you know, it's, it's a little bit more particular to the setup and you just have to be, you just have to be more focused and be paying attention. You can't be off. Yep. Instead of having to put like, 
eight turns in the left rear, you might only have to put three, you know, yeah. and it's going to have the yeah. same effect. You know, it's just, that's what a guy has to figure out. That's. Um, Phil, do you, you, do you all use load sticks with your setups? Um, of course I, I don't, I know Chad and Bob would probably hate me saying that. And I, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to like bad mouth load sticks. I, but I, I myself don't use load sticks and you know, you, it's a great setup tool when you get your car, in my opinion, when you get your car where you want it. I mean, on a stock car, a uh, modified is a little more particular. It's a little bit more, you know, you're, you're really paying attention to your spring loads on that. Where a stock car, you can get away with using a tape measure and or just measuring your car. I and the one false narrative I think I was out there, and anybody could tell me I'm wrong by saying this, but the part I hate is when people say that I load stick my car only. Like in my belief, you still have to scale your race car because you still want to know where your left side weight, your rear weight, and your left rear bite is. I mean, right now we're to the point even with the stock cars, we don't even pay attention to left rear bite. We're just putting rounds in and rounds out, you know, measuring spring end load with a tape measure, but you, you just you have you have to scale your car. I mean, it's still part of the process. If you if you can get a really good notebook where you got every you know you wouldn't have to then if you start you know getting all your measurements. But I don't know if anybody's ever gonna get that deep to do that. But that's that's my take on the load sticks. It's a good thing to have, but you don't think that you have to have it in order to win races. That's my opinion. Don't hate me, Chad. Oh, I don't hate you, and that's that's a fact. I mean, we build the <clears throat> we build the load machines and the load sticks and. I just I go back to the one guy that uh, I don't remember where he was from. But he said I finally sold my scales so I could buy a spring smasher, and I'm like, that sir was the big yeah, mistake of your career. That was a big big mistake. Right. You the big load, mistake. All the load machine does and the the load stick does is help you tune at the track. You still yes. have to scale your car. You always have that baseline on scales. A load stick's not going to tell you that the spindle's bent. You have to go on scales to see that. There's so many things and so many guys get caught up and wrapped up in load machines and load sticks that you forget the basics. So really they're right. a tool for changing springs accurately at the track when you're on grass and not a flat surface. And they make that job easy and they collect data so you know when you're good, why you were good, and when you suck, why you sucked. Yep. And that's one thing too, like, we could spend a whole nother hour. That should be like the segment. And I, I wish we could hit on that. Like the smoke and mirrors of auto racing. Like I could go off on that for like 45 minutes. Cause the one thing I hate is that, I mean, there are tools like you, you know, you don't, you don't need to win races and there's tools that people do need to win races. And, and, you know, there's cars you don't need to buy to win races and there's cars you need to buy and there's parts you need to buy and there's parts you don't need to buy. So, I mean, like I always say, there's that, you know, back in the 1800s, you got the old guy who comes in with his elixir truck. You know, I got your fix-all cure all right here. You know, this thing's going to take you to the promised land. It's like, yeah, when they're selling stuff, I mean, it's just, but that that's a whole different deal. But, um, and I'm not saying the load stick smoke and mirrors, but it's definitely one of those deals. You don't need it to win races, but it's nice for the toolbox. There, I mean, it's good. It's, when you get in depth into your setups, it's a good tool to have. There's no doubt about it. And I'll get you back to point A, you know, a lot quicker when you get when you find out where you like your car or where you like stuff it'll get you there quicker too you can get right back to it well and i think the thing was that i like about the load stick itself you still scale the car you do everything you would normally do way back when same old stuff but then you can put the load stick on it and get some data that you have for your notebook and then when you go to the right. racetrack or whatever the case is um, you know, if, if, if you're off a little bit, you can at least have some sort of a tool that's going to give you a precise adjustment, but you're right. You don't need the load stick to win races. It's just, uh, I, I think there's advantages in, in both ways, but, um, Cody says that his 1100 is in the right front and his thousand is in the left front and it's tight in the center. Uh, I would have to say if he switched those two springs around, he would be better off. Yep. The, a lot of the times when you get tight on the gas, a lot of that can be, you know, if you got too much, if you got too much uh, casters or too much right front caster, you can pull some of that out. But really what shears your tire is your left rear is overdriving your right front. So, you know, when you get on the gas, you're shearing the right front and then that's no longer track, you know, gripping. So that's what's driving you up the track. So 
you either need to obviously like Bob just said, soften the right front, you know, get the car down on the nose. So then it, you know, or get a bigger tie down or something. But I would say if you have 1100 on the right front, you're creating a lot of forward drive. So I, yeah, you soften the right front, you'd probably be really good. Um, Les says, depends on which builder you ask. All are different. Remember the late model and the old flexi flyer chassis. Again, depends on on whom you ask. Um, I do know that the majority of the late model stuff that's going really good out there is the, they're finding stiffer than what they used to be. Uh, Adam, yep. how are you guys liking the new Camaro plastic body compared to the old style steel Monte Carlo body. Um, I mean, it looks cool. That's about all I can tell you about it. What's your yeah, that, nobody, nobody's got one. We don't know. We haven't got a race one yet to see what's going to happen. But I got to imagine there's going to be a lot of, with all the plastic body panels. Um, there's probably going to be a lot of long cautions because there's probably going to debris all over the racetrack. We know how the, the nose and tails kind of hold up and that's what the whole car is going to be built out of. So it'll it'll be interesting everybody's freaking out over change ain't they <laughs> yeah they do they it's just like it is what it is you know yeah i think they look cool but yeah they it, do look cool yeah it looks a lot more like an asphalt car that i seen yesterday where the tires are all covered and they're real yeah clean. well that's that's yeah. been the one we saw at the super nationals there it it had more resemblance to a pavement car by far and uh not going to be good for the rap business and that's All one right. point sabizma pointed that out at, at super nationals he's like man then we're going to suck to rap well that's you look at the asphalt cars you know there was a 150 200 cars there last weekend at that race and i think there was three wraps you know because the cars are so curvaceous and it's you can't get the wraps to conform to that so that class might see a lot of number and, and individual stickers instead of wraps huh. bring back the paint jobs did you answer Chris Adams had a question? Did you see that one or no? I uh, must have missed it. The only problem I have seen with the Speedway frame? Yeah, the only like problem four. I've seen with the Speedway frame is the bent rear frame rails. They don't lay flat, but overall very nice. Yeah. Yeah, I know what he's saying there, but that it's it's kind of weird how they laid out in the back back there. I know, but it's not yeah, it's not a bad deal if you make a we just made like a spring perch or whatever, like a C channel or whatever that we can bolt it right down. And then, but it, it seemed to lay out. It works pretty good. Awesome. Well, since we're caught up, we're working on a new category on our website. Awesome. <laughs> called, called scratch and dent. Scratch and dent. Scratch and we had, we had such a pile of stuff that's been sent back, and then when people send it back, they don't wrap it up. So then the two parts uh, touch oh, each yeah. other way back and get all scratched up, and and then you can't resell it for retail for, for retail price. So we're working on a new scratch and dent uh, section on the website that'll be coming pretty soon with stuff that's you know new but slightly damaged, whether it's lasered wrong here or it gets sent back and gets kind of destroyed on the way back in the UPS truck and. So that's something that we're uh, we're excited to launch that, give guys a spot to find a little bit of a discount on something if they don't care what it looks like. Well, that'd be, yeah, that'd be a cool deal. Yeah, no doubt. That's like in the parts trailer. I get guys that'll go grab a $36 sleeve of tear-offs and then pull them out, and then they put them on their helmet, and they don't fit, and then they stick them back in, and they're hanging out all over, and then they want you to return them. <laughs> yeah, You're like going out. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, it's just stuff mm -hmm. like that, exactly. I should have a scratch and dent for tear-offs. Oh. Yeah. I don't miss those parts trailer deals at all. That I, going to the racetrack on a weekly basis with parts. You know, oh. We used to do that. You know, we used to at one time years and years ago with Harris Auto Racing, we covered seven racetracks. And had two trailers. Oh man. I do Inventory, one and it's it's tough. Inventory was a nightmare. You never knew yep. where stuff was. And uh, I was and it seemed to me, what, what I actually, every time I cut out a racetrack, my sales went up. I don't understand that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is there any word on other body style composite bodies for stock cars? Run the plastic 
MD3 panels on my BMOD. I love them. I really don't like the body style of the Camaro body, or the, I mean body style, body. body style of the Camaro body, so I'm putting steel on. Um, you know, it's just another one of those deals that, it kind of depends on how you look at change and if you want to be the guy that wants to experiment with it or if you want to be the guy that i know how the steel works let's give it another year and see how this new body takes on that's just you know your choice man it's just kind of the way it goes well i know because um, i kind of was you know i i was i've been on the the last two years i was on the the um deal with brett you know we kind of i was on the same path with them with that frame you know i was long he brought me along through the whole journey on that. And then that body kind of, you know, on the backside, I, you know, I didn't have any input on that body, but he was showing me what they're doing. And I know exactly why they did it. I mean, the problem is, is that, you know, IMCA doesn't have a template for a body. And then they, you know, people don't want the performance body, um, you know, or whatever the reason is. So then people started fabricating their own bodies. Well, then they need to somehow police that body. Right. And, and, and so, cause I get it. He doesn't want, bodies to look like you know super stocks or pro stocks or whatever so some i mean there's actually down at boone there's probably four or five of them that were you know you can see they're kind of getting out of hand so that's kind of why they they came out with this it's easier it's it's they don't have to deal with you know it's like here's the body i you know and they're not going to mandate it they're still going to give you the option of you know other body you know whatever other body and you know blah 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 but i, I know they want to get rid of the home built you know fabricated we actually make a stock car body which I wish we could get approved because I, you know, it's pretty inexpensive and it and it follows all the dimensions of a stock frame or stock body. But you know, that's not what IMCA wants, and I understand it's a it's a logistical nightmare for them to keep track of all that stuff. So, yeah, I think uh, Braden bought a body from you this year. Yep, put, yeah, put that on for Super Nationals. It doesn't look like it did before Super Nationals. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I don't think there's a yeah. square into that thing that doesn't have a dent in it. But yeah, exactly. We knew it was just a matter of time. Yeah. Burger, are you able to install a hitch on the back of your stock car so I can have Luft drag me to the front with him next year? <laughs> we can. Yeah, we can do that. Put a reese hitch back there or something. Yeah. Sure. Something like a quick coupler or something. Yeah. That'd work. Yeah. Exactly. It's funny though, you know, like, cause in the stock car, you know, like he gets, it's funny. Cause like in, in the sport mod, you know, he just gets in and wins. And then in the stock car, you know, it's not that easy. And then you're like, if, if you're off a little on the car, it's just, it's funny to watch how frustrated he gets. So trying to understand when he's a competitive driver as he is, but I always feel bad. Like last couple of weeks, we gave him a, a crappy race car and it showed in his finishes, but then you give him a car that's where it's supposed to be. And then he does magical things with it. So it's pretty fun to watch, but. Ryan races with him out at Arlington. So, oh, gotcha. Yep. But it's funny. It's just like it goes back to anything. You know, doesn't matter how good of a driver you are. If the car is not good, there the car doesn't work. You ain't gonna. You're not gonna go forward. Well, you know, Kevin Harvick made the statement quite a few years ago that a great driver can't make a slow car go fast. Right. Right. Nope, that's for sure. And the worst part is, you know, back in the day, I mean, I think that's just how racing's evolved. You know, you look back, you know, the days of Mark Noble and, you know, Ron Jones and where everybody, you know, that, you know, the technology of, of suspensions wasn't as, as crazy as it is now. So, I mean, kind of when I made that statement before, like if you're not measuring your suspension with a tape measure, the guy that just passed you is, you know, or if you, you know, it's just that, I mean, it's, it's to that point where it's that, you know, if you're off a little bit, you're off a lot. Well, you know, and I'm seeing the, the fact that, you know, some of these guys um, don't race as much as they used to. And I don't care what anything no. says that, you know, whether you're on a basketball team or a football team, I mean, the, the, the more you play it, the more you do it, the, the better you're going to get. And, and, right. and, and I know that that's, you know, one of the guys that we help quite a bit, uh, I'm hoping that next year he races a little bit more because it, it's just easier than uh if, if if you can go to more different racetracks you're, you're just going to be better um, right, John, right on the three link modified are there advantages of chaining the right rear um i'll let you have that one chad 
Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> chain in the right rear, definitely the tighter you make the right rear chain, the more grip you're going to have. The problem is when you get into rough or if you're up on the cushion and that chain gets tight, you're going to steer the right front of the fence or your neighbor on the outside of you. So uh, you really need to be careful and you really need to, to monitor the track. You know, I mean, there was one time back in the day when we first started this and we learned that tightening the chain up was was traction. You know, my brother went really fast and I thought a little was good. So I went a lot more and the track developed a hole going into turn one and he junked the car. And that's why, because we got to <clears throat> put the right rear chain. So it's something that, you know, I mean, you can tune with it, but I would never go under uh, an inch and a quarter. I would have minimum of an inch and a quarter slack. Isn't there an old saying that sometimes there's a, a time and a place and sometimes there isn't a time and sometimes there isn't a place. Well, the I'm not a fan. Even like, even like, even the stock cars with you guys, that'll put a massive tie down on the right rear, and that's always the end result. You know, it just it puts so much drive into the car that I mean, if it's slick smooth and you don't have a chuck hole or a cushion to rip on, then you. But I mean, that's tough to make that call before you roll out on the track because most time there's always both of those when you're at a racetrack. But and you definitely don't want a cushion if you're gonna run. No, uh -uh. Tie down. no. No doubt, because you hit the cushion and you're go, you're over it because the front end can't come close to sticking. Yep. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm not a huge fan of the chain. Uh, you know, I, I know one night I had I kind of had to chuckle because uh, I had a customer. I was standing up there on the catwalk at noon, and and I kind of noticed this customer's car was coming. He had a different driver driving it or whatever the case was. And come up off the corner. And at Boone, it's very, if you've got the chain any tight at all, you're going to get a tire hop coming out of turn two. I mean, it's just it's just a freaking given. I don't know what there is about that racetrack, but if you do, and I mean, his car was hopping and bouncing, and he says, why does it do it? It does it all the time. And I say, oh, your right rear chain's too tight. Well, they had it really tight, and... Uh, Needless to say, they took the chain off it, fixed that problem, and the feature looked pretty good. So it was like, yeah, I, I've seen it happen. And, I mean, you can have it a, just a hair tight, and it will be a handful coming on turn to it. But it's just, just the way it is. Right. Um, have you decided who the instructors are for your stock car class this winter? Um, well, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be there. Um, Paul said that he wanted to be involved. And Mike Nichols, last I talked to him, wanted to be involved. And, um, and of course, Troy Jerovich, who works for me, will be there. Um, that's, the, that's what's confirmed at this point. Um, I'm not really sure. What do you think, Paul? Should we should we get somebody? Should, who should we get? I don't know. Mike can get a little. He can get a little. Yeah, if you bring in another person, Mike get all. Mike get a. Mike might get all defensive or something. You know how he can get little little caddy. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't know. Maybe Matt Loaf to do it. He knows how to drive a stock car a little bit. Is no, I don't know. Talk? I mean, you got. Is what do you got? Talker? Four, five, four, four guys. I bet you Matt would do it for free. He'd probably do it for. Is Matt a talker? Yeah, no, not really, but he is. Really, probably have have Brittany up there. I bet His you wife I does. Said, I've known him for quite some time, and I bet you I haven't had a hundred word conversation with him. <laughs> yep. Uh, let's see here, uh, Nelly. Are you gonna have? A hobby stock class. Um, gonna, gonna have a hobby stock class. Well, the hobby stock class kind of goes in line with the stock car class. It won't be a separate hobby stock class. Uh, and what we do with the hobby stock thing, we kind of judge. You know, say we have sixty people in the in, in there, and we have uh, fifteen hobby stock guys. We might focus a little bit more on some of the stock car stuff, but it's important to you know always ask questions at those schools because i mean we're there and a lot of times the question you ask 
there's 15 other people that have the same question. They just are afraid to ask. And then it actually gives us other avenues because all of a sudden when you get that question, then all of a sudden you think of something else. And, oh, yeah, I need to tell them about this. And I need to tell them about this. And so the questions at the schools. Now, I will have to say pretty much every class we have one guy that has 122 questions. But, you know, we'll take that. That's okay. Uh, he's paying the same as everybody else. So if he's got those questions, we'll try to answer them the best we can. I think there's only been one class that I told the guy that, all right, you reached your limit for questions today. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was a class that we did up in North Dakota, and he sat in the front row. And, you know, by the time you get to the end of the second day, you're kind of wore out, you're tired, your throat's sore. Little. Yeah. And you can't little think rammy. anymore. So, yeah, a little snappy. No, so, so sometimes you get a little short. Uh, Jesse says, GRT by BT for the win. Awesome. Way to go, Jesse. That's great. Uh, we'll definitely, I'll have the, have the guys look that up tomorrow. And I know they'll be posting some other winners tomorrow. Uh, um, Taylor Cool won out there in, in, in Sioux City and, and then didn't pass tech because our, her nose got bent down somehow. And so they, Doctor two spots and put her back to third. Um, anyway, and Jared says, thanks for all your help. Uh, got me to the first win of the year. Well, way to go, Jared. That's awesome. Um, that's kind of what it's all about. I mean, you know, it's just like, you know, we, we made a sign or you know, one of the flyers that we made. It's, you winning is what we're all about. And, and, and that really is the case. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I'm quite sure Paul was almost as happy as Kelly Sharrock to win that race at, at uh, Boone. Um, you know, and then, of course, McBurney ended up winning the uh, BMV. The, the All Star race. All Star race. Yeah. And so, yeah, BMV had a pretty good week. But anyway, uh, let's see here. Um, Camaro Hobby Stock, if you don't remember. Oh, okay. Uh, Jesse, hopefully we can pick up one up one in Vegas and Arizona this winter. Now, I, I've heard that uh, there's some sort of an insurance issue with Cocopa, which, of course, you know, I, I think Cocopa is one of the nicest race decks that I have seen uh, in, in Arizona, or at least I've had good luck there. Uh, so it's sad that that's they're having some insurance issues and they're going to move it to Central Arizona Speedway. Uh, I've only been to Central Arizona Speedway a, a couple times, so I can't really say for whatever, but they'll still have a winter series. Uh, I know there's some stuff going on down in Texas during the winter. Uh, so they're going to, in Florida, they're racing, I mean, they're gonna be racing everywhere. Um, David, how can you change ride heights on a hobby stock? without going to a 12 inch spring in the front. I wouldn't know that's you, Paul. How, how can, how can, how can you change ride height on a hobby stock without going to a 12 inch spring? I mean, it depending on what you want to do. Like, I mean, if you, um, if you want to lower your ride height or if you want to raise your, I mean, obviously you're going to go 12 inch. I don't know. I kind of don't know what your question is. Like if you, cause I mean, if you, you can cut your front springs in IMCA, if I'm not mistaken, you're, they're allowed to cut the spring. So, I mean, and I don't, you know, some guys will say don't do it. Um, but sometimes you're forced to do what you got to do. You take quarter turn your quarter coil out of it or a whole coil out of it. I, I really don't think you're going to affect that spring by like 10, 20 pounds. So, um, but you know, I, I do know, I do know a lot of guys that are, running a softer right front and put a 12 inch spring in there, you know, go like where, you know, it's kind of the same thing you do in the stock car modified where if you, you know, you're just putting rounds into it. So you just do that with a taller spring. So you say you got a thousand in the right front and you want to lower your ride height, but you don't want to, you know, 900, whatever's too low, go to a 12 inch 800 or 12 inch 700 and put it in the right front. So, but it's something you got to mess around with. You can't, it's not always a one hit wonder. Um, 
we got our last question. Uh, we're a little over. In fact, actually, we got one more question, and that that's it. Um, for ballast placement, do you guys have a preference on where to put it? I see some people stacking it around the fuel cell fuel cell to get um, um, to get the fuel cell to get rear percentage up. But no, some people swear to have it on the front of the rear end. Also, what do you suggest is a good rear percentage to use? We currently have 57%. We're rocking a 2015 BMB built by Paul himself. That's an old girl. I know Joel. He he races UMP out there. Um, that's a that's a long-winded response on that for rear weight, because I mean it's you, there's a lot going on there. I mean, anytime you have lead high in the car, it's going to transfer and roll over to the right rear. And then it's going to, then it's hard to come back. So the higher you have your lead, the more it's going to roll over, but then it's going to stay there. It's not going to come back. Lower you put it in the car, it's actually not going to roll over as much, but it's actually, you know, if you have the right spring combination, it's going to stick the right rear harder because it's actually, but then sometimes it can shear the tire because now you have lead going this way through the car. So, I mean, Rule of thumb and all the classes and everything, you know, always, you know, camshaft height or even chest height, you know, with the driver back. Um, the one thing I've learned in my car, the way I have it set up, um, I I like my lead a lot lower. But I, I you, you definitely, if you're three-wheeling, you got your leads too high. You got to lower it. You just, you know, you need some lead up high and you need some lead low. And I hate to use the word, it's a balance, but it's the truth. I mean, and as far as forward and back, um, I don't like to say people say swing weight. I don't like to say like, obviously the more lead you put forward, it's going to have less effect on the car. The more lead you bring back, the more effect it's going to have on the car. So when you put it right behind the fuel cell, it's going to have more effect. Yes, it's going to free the car up, but you can combat that with left side weight or doing something else to tighten the car up. If we put it 20 feet out the back of the car on a pole, then I would call that swing weight. Um, I'm not afraid to put lead behind my fuel cell. If you get over a hundred pounds, I wouldn't do that. I, I would keep it in that 75 to 100 pounds behind the fuel cell, but you got to do what you got to do to get rear percentage. I know the tires you guys run on, I think 57% is kind of high. Like it would be high for an IMCA stock car, um, but with the tires, and I know you guys got to carry a ton of lead, you know, so I mean, you're kind of forced to have to run what your guys are running. So, but you guys got different motor deal and all that stuff. Like for us with the two barrels and our motor package, we can't, I mean, 54 and a half is is pushing it in my opinion 55 and a half is probably really pushing it hopefully that wasn't a mouthful but um matt heidelball so look at that right there i didn't even good. do that there yeah i didn't even i meant to do that when makaya made a comment but when we we're talking about him but matt says he wants to thank all three of us guys for helping their program come alive the last three years top-notch parts from chad excellent Paul, excellent Paul, and excellent shocks from Braden and Bobby. Thank you guys all. Well, we appreciate that, Matt. Uh, I, I know Thanks, we Matt. all appreciate your business, and uh, uh, your program's good. That 72H, like I said, he should have won last weekend. Uh, if it wouldn't have been for that, the old fickle restart with two laps to go, uh, that always screws everything up. Uh, the kid's doing a good job. I mean, he. He's, he's really look good. That's uh, the pressure cooker. There's nothing worse than being put in that either. Uh, A lap or two laps ago, and you got to restart. And... Yeah. Uh, David says, thank you. Gary says, your thoughts on adding lead to the left rear axle tube on a hobby stock or a street stock car, good or bad? Well, most sanctioning bodies don't allow that. Um, I mean, if you could add a chunk of lead to the housing, I mean, that's, you know, that's traction on that tire. Uh, you just want to check with your uh, sanctioning body to make sure that you don't have one. Um, spring table question. So if I run a 12 inch spring and a 11 inch uh, uh, left front and a 12 inch right front, and add a one inch spacer on the top of both, do I still need to have one inch of spring table? Or would I still have? 
Yeah, because you did it on both. If you change and manipulate one or the other, then you would change the spring table. Yeah, no, that's that's totally correct. All right, guys, we went a little over. I appreciate your time and energy there, and thanks, Paul, for joining us tonight. Uh, good. Yep. To, anytime. Good to see you. Probably won't see you till yep, February. Good to see you guys. And yep. Brad, as always, thanks for all your help and and uh, appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. All right. Absolutely. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.